I wasn't even supposed to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known you were going to do that. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, that's that's the best introduction we've done ever. This is uh, this is the thirteenth episode, thirteenth yes. lucky thirteen of of shallow and pedantic, a serious podcast about unimportant things. I'm Andrew. I'm Mike. I'm Kieran. Awesome. And uh, as as Kieran indicated, we're we're talking about the. I was going to say great American filmmaker, but we're just going to have to say American filmmaker uh, Kevin Smith. And uh, I got a real bug in my ear a couple of weeks ago. We talked about this on the Discord. Uh, I suddenly had an impulse to talk about Kevin Smith. And um, the reason I wanted to do that is I don't remember what inspired me to do that. <laughs> it was just this some, something I saw on Twitter. It's like, Kevin Smith, we need to talk about Kevin Smith. Because there was a time when Kevin Smith was as important uh, as a filmmaker – of our generation as say Quentin Tarantino and uh, uh, Tarantino and Kevin Smith came up at about the same time. Uh, Reservoir yeah, Dogs was 1991 right. and Clerks was 1993. Yep. Um, so my first instinct is to compare them because Mike, we've talked about Tarantino a couple of times Yeah, and uh, yep. I not as much as Dune, but Definitely. No, we don't talk about anything as much as we talk about Dune. <laughs> how great! How great would it be if that movie never came out and we just kept talking about Dune? It became like Jodorowsky's Dune, and it just never happened. It became a legend. That might be the best can. thing that ever happened. <laughs> just in the can permanently. It, yeah. it would we could have had us- Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> Aquaman, Duncan, Idaho. Release the Aquaman cut. <laughs> oh. Um, where was I going with this? All right. Anyway, uh, I've talked. We talked about Tarantino a couple of times, and I've uh, had. I've got this line that um, Tarantino is the last great American director mm. because he's the last director who has mass appeal as a director, and complete normies will line up to see a movie he makes just because he's made it. Like he has the kind of cachet that uh Hitchcock or Oh yeah. Um, oh, definitely. Who am I thinking of? Not Spielberg. Cuz Spielberg is mill. <laughs> I killed Mormon and Cecil B. DeMille. Um <laughs> who am I thinking of? Yeah, Francis Ford Coppola. Kubrick, uh, Coppola or Kubrick. I was or thinking Q- Kubrick. Yeah, Kubrick, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, Kubrick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, he um, had... Um... Because, like, those guys were always consistent through their careers. Like, they made some good movies, they made some not-some-good movies, um, but they're they're always consistent. Like, oh, uh... Sure. So that's that's and, why I put him up in that pantheon. Because he and has... to be fair, in that pay- pantheon, those directors, even if they're not great movies, are usually heads and shoulders above other people's good movies. Right, sure. like a bad Hitchcock movie or, or a bad Kubrick movie is still worth watching. Like I'll, I'll admit I was bored in, um, watching, uh, Barry Lyndon, but I'll probably watch it again at some point. So, and for the longest time, I couldn't remember if I'd ever seen the end of full metal jacket. No, I had, it was just so anticlimactic that I couldn't remember that. I had. It's so good. (laughs) It is. It is metal jacket. But it's, I could never remember that I'd seen the end of it. It's so much better than Platoon. It, it blows my mind that, that Platoon won Best Picture and, and Full Metal Jacket didn't. Ah, well, some some people just can't can't handle R E R Lee Ermy going full batshit on a bunch <sighs> of kids. I mean, what are you going to do? So great. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, but I yeah. would say that you mentioned Coppola, but Coppola, as we we kind of talked about Coppola like in last month because of Bram Stoker's Dracula, how Coppola yeah. kind of like started off like he was like it's the godfather like he's never yeah, going to yeah. be forgotten as a filmmaker just because he did the godfather he can yep. he can wear that on his grave put that on his tombstone um but he is the uncle of nick cage so there it, there might be something in the bloodline man that's not his fault <laughs> <laughs> he didn't make nick cage and you know what nick cage is, <laughs> is a topic for a whole nother time that's true <laughs> uh, i support nick cage even at his 
worst. I support Nick Cage. But um, where was I going with this? Um, Kevin's how crazy. Tarantino uh, is what you consider one of the last great American directors. And um, Kevin Smith is more like Smith Francis just- Ford Coppola because he just kind of dropped. Like Coppola did um, the v- what's the Vietnam movie? Apocalypse Now. Well, it's now. How do I not? I've seen that a bunch of times, mm-hmm. and that like drained the life force out of him. And then he was never able to do anything at, at that level ever again. Like Godfather Three is is like a Godfather fan film, and it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like and, watching somebody do fan fiction of their own work. Yeah, it's terrible, uh, and and then that's why it's it's a good comparison to Kevin Smith. Um. So I want to, you know, we can, I want to talk about Kevin Smith compared to Quentin Tarantino. And I also have this, this other comparison that I'm going to make, which is going to make no sense the first time I make it, okay. but stay with me. I'm going to compare him to Bukowski oh, in okay. a negative way, Ah, okay. in a negative way, all right, first all right. in a positive way. I know that makes no sense, but in my head, it makes sense. Also, I've been reading a lot of Bukowski lately. So Kevin Smith, Clerks, right? I saw that, like, my freshman year in college, like, the year after it came out. Um, as with Pulp Fiction, I hadn't ever really seen anything like that. I was 17, 18 years old. I think it was 18 when I saw Clerks. And it was, like, like accessible art house. Yeah. And it was very specific, but at the same time, very accessible. Like, it, it screams New Jersey, but... It also hit a lot of touchstones that reached beyond. Like, this is a movie that a lot of people embraced. It was a big hit. It's still, I think, a film worth watching. Uh, it speaks to its time and has some certain universalities. It, it helps if you are of our age to watch yeah. it. But I think, I think anyone who's ever worked that kind of job can get that and appreciate it for what it is. The old retail hell. Yeah, retail hell. We've all yeah. been there. Every everybody, pretty much everybody's there now. When it's bullshit conversations about Star Wars. Nope. It's the entire well, it's, internet I, now. It was uh, and, uh, it was interesting. I, I I saw like an interview with Kevin Smith and he talked about how his inspiration for clerks was he actually saw this other film called Slacker. Um, which oh. I don't know if either of you have, have ever seen it. I've seen like um, some of it. I don't think I made it all the way through. It's not a bad movie. It was just, you know, it was like a, an indie film that came out in like, I want to say like 1990. 90 or um, 91, yeah. Yeah, something like that. It was like real early like 90s uh, indie film. And it's basically just a bunch of vignettes of people in this small town, you know, going around sort of like slice of life, uh, you know, type of movie. And he saw that and he was like, so this is a, this is an okay movie. Like, this is fine. I think I can do better. And then he went and he made Clerks, and that was essentially his his inspiration, because um, he was like, well, if they can do this with Slacker, then I can do what I know, and mm-hmm. yeah, this was the beginning of the, of the View Askewiverse, uh, as I, it were. I really appreciate that level of ambition, that kind of, like, self-regards, like, I can do that, I can do that better. And uh, I think I made it like halfway through Slackers and like the lack of structure to it and the the stylistic variation kind of, I wasn't prepared for that. So I kind of got bored. Um, So I don't think I finished watching it. It's essentially just an anthology in movie form. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of little slice of life episodes of just random ass people in this town. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I was kind of what I was getting. So, okay, so Clerks comes out, but it I think uh, it it made a huge splash. Like people, it got people noticed. It went to film festivals. It, it, I think it won some awards. Like I feel like it went to Cannes and did super great. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but he became like a big deal overnight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He did. He really did. He re- became a big um, deal overnight, much like Tarantino became a big deal overnight after he did Reservoir Dogs. He was kind of already in the industry, though. Like, he had already been, like, writing mm-hmm. screenplays. Um, yeah. True Romance was his screenplay, which is yep. uh, 
a really no, oh, yeah, that was wonderful good. film. He wrote the uh, screenplay for Natural Born Killers. He did Oliver write Stone that, film. didn't he? Yeah, yep. yeah. I ever, yeah. I'm trying to remember. Hey, Mike, did me and you go see that in the theater? Which Natural Born Killers? Yeah, no. Some with one of my friends. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it's basically an extremely violent movie that content that's whose purpose is to. Uh, basically condemn the way that the media glorifies violence. So, you know, and you're kind of like, all right, Ollie, like, I get it, but, like, did you, did you, did you have to? That's it's also um, part of the missing the point starter package. <laughs> Back and to the left. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. <laughs> to be fair, Juliet Lewis was very hot in that film. So, oh, yeah. um, yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, Juliet Juliet um, Lewis definitely has moments where she's hot. She was great. Uh, in that was, film. Uh, Woody Harrelson was great in that film. Um, yeah, she was great. Robert in, Downey um, Jr. was good in that film. Yeah, that's true. He was, and that that's back when he had uh, he had some problems. It's not Iron Man when he was yeah. when he was someone else altogether. When he was uh, less than zero. Yeah, when he uh, when he I was see in what you the, did there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was in that movie and was like, you know, this lifestyle. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take this. I'm just gonna keep this going is, with it. This sounds great. I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> do drugs every day and be a movie star. Fuck yes, I'm gonna just gonna do that. Shit. Isn't and that why like, we're right. here? What are what are we doing? What's the <laughs> <laughs> downside? I don't see any. So like Tarantino was kind of already in the business. Like he yes, was he correct. was up and coming. He had his moment. Uh, he did Reservoir Dogs and. Um, and he was he was uh, he was off to the races, or at least it seemed like at first. But I was doing some some math, and Tarantino has only made nine films. Mm-hmm. Since, he only intends to make ten uh, since nineteen ninety one. Nine films. Mm-hmm. That's not a lot. No. And that's kind of what I think allows him to keep his cachet a little bit. Like he doesn't just yeah. he doesn't just spend it out. He did he he had to do a quick follow up to Reservoir Dogs. He did Pulp Fiction, which was like made him a thing. Like that's his Godfather. And yeah. then the follow up to that came three years later, and it was Jackie Brown. Yeah, which is by no means a bad movie. No, not at all. It, not at all. It grows on me. I've watched it a lot. Uh, but at first time I watched it, I was like, what is, is that it? This is what, I mean, cool Quentin, but what? And I think that's what I remember the critics and reviews saying at the times, like, I don't understand what this is. Is this, is this it? What well, it was, it was him basically doing a riff on like, literally like the black exploitation genre. Um, uh-huh. and he did, and he was very faithful in terms of like duplicating that seventies, like killer pimp kind of movie, uh, yeah. which there were actually a surprising number. Um, and he was, he faithfully recreated it. It's a much better movie than Superfly. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I, I, that was, that was a chore to sit through and I love that soundtrack, but still. That movie was a chore to sit through, but Jackie Brown is not. It has charms, and no. it, it gets better the more you watch it. You really appreciate it as as a character film. I think I, the first time I watched it, I, I said to myself, what is Michael Keaton doing in this movie? And now, now I know what he's doing in this movie, and it's fantastic. I asked much the question about the first Batman film. What is Michael <laughs> Keaton doing in this movie? How dare you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? He is objectively the best Batman. I mean, I agree with you, but upon first initial concept of Mr. Mom and Beetlejuice as Batman, okay? <laughs> Mr. Mom and Beetlejuice. That's what everyone said. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm channeling the zeitgeist of the time. You are, and that's that's appropriate. But then – so then he did Kill Bill, which was which was a whole other thing, and he's, he's kind of um, off to the I'm races gonna... there. But he's only – he's like – he's making the movies that he wants to make – that he pretty he much writes and they're his creations. They're his art. And he doesn't really care about anything else. Um, and I said only, only nine films in the last 30 years. Mm-hmm. Compare that to Kevin Smith. For, like I said, three in the nineties, he was, he was, he was a big deal. He was, uh, he was another voice of a generation director. He did five movies between in, in eight years. 
Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Clerks, Mall Rats, right. Chasing, Chasing Amy, Amy, Dogma, and Jane Silent Bob's Strike Back. The first Jane Silent Bob movie was 2001. Yeah. Yep. Or 2002. So eight or nine years, he did five movies. And I cannot fault that level of productivity. Like that's that shows a certain dedication to his to his work and wanting to get stuff done and wanting to make movies and I respect that. But uh, at the same time, I, I kind of feel as though he did himself a disservice by doing that. It's like it's like a lot of things in the '90s. So it was like here, here's this indie thing. Let's suck it up, suck all the life out of it, drain it like a vampire, and then it's gone. I have a slightly different perspective on that. And just because of something that he himself had said, um, he would not have been able to make those movies had he waited longer to make them than he did. Because by the time he got done with his second to last view of Skewerverse, uh, James Percent Bob Starkeck, he was no longer that young middle-class white kid from New Jersey that had to hustle. Mm -hmm. He was now a Hollywood dude. He lived in California in Ben Affleck's old house up in the hills. You know, he had gotten married. He'd had a kid. So the young, struggling, hungry, single dude was not him anymore. So the stories he was telling from that perspective, from that, that generational perspective that we're part of, are no could no longer be genuine because that's not him anymore. And he's so detached from that, that he barely remembers what being that is. I, I think that's, that's very true. And uh, I, I have to give himself credit for being a, being self-aware of that. I, I do want to say that um, everything that we're, I'm saying tonight about him is strictly in terms of his art and his work. I don't, I'm oh, not yeah, going to yeah, yeah. talk about the guy personally, or is, oh, I don't know is, him personally. Yeah, I don't know him personally. And everything I've seen of him and his interaction online, he seems like a really nice guy and a really genuine, self-aware, unpretentious human being. So I he feel like if, tell a good story. Right. And I felt like if I met him, I'd be like, you're a cool guy, Kevin Smith. And I think that he would be like, hey, cool. Like, you know, I, I could not begin to like, this is not about him. I'm not going to make fun of him being overweight or wearing jorts. Um my wife is of the opinion that his decline of, in his filmmakers because he continued to wear jorts. But <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the hockey shirts, personally. But... <laughs> but I don't think he even does that anymore. And I, you know, so this is not about him. Oh, no. Um, I mean, not at all. Not at all. And like, you know, much as we do, he also does podcasts. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and he, he, he's very good at the podcasting. Like he, he likes to talk. He likes to tell a story. And it may just be that he just doesn't quite have – it may be that – it may just simply be that film may not be the medium of which he can tell a good story through anymore. But he can still tell a good story. I think um, I think you're right. And I think he may be – he may be more important as a podcaster than he is as a filmmaker. I'm not super familiar with his podcast, but I think he may have made a greater mark there. He's got three or four, man. Yeah. So I think I think that might be true. But I think what what you just said, Kieran, kind of really dovetails to what I was saying, because I think going Hollywood is a disservice, did a disservice to his career as a filmmaker. Yeah, true. Oh, because certainly. Because if you look at if you look at Mallrats, which is the movie he made right after right after Clerks, I know what I think of that movie. Tell me what you think of that movie. I think it's funny as fuck, um, but it also touches on subjects of which I have great interest, like comic books um, and comic book movies and hanging at – well, not hanging them all anymore because I don't go to things like that anymore. Never mind, you know, current state of things, but I just don't shop. But, um, you know, having it out with my friends, talking bullshit about comic books sure. and – inappropriate sexual innuendo and all that shit, you know? 100%. Um, so it certainly speaks to me. And most of his view askew averse ones do. It's his non-view askew stuff I have a hard time with. Um, like, I never bothered with yoga hosers. Um, no one did. No, no one did. He's no like, did. oh, why'd I make that? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, he himself's like, why'd I make He's that? He's trying to get his... his 
family members work essentially yeah um i haven't seen his two horror films but from what i understand they are scary as fuck you i've know, heard people like, come give mixed remarks about about his his horror films and uh we'll get into that in a second because i've never seen any of that because i'm kind of yeah, yeah, i've only i've only seen bits and pieces of them i think they are less a problem in concept and may simply be a question of editing and or pacing possibly execution let's put um, a pin in that because i want to i'm going to want to come back to that yeah, we can get back to that i want to come back to that point because it, it's going to go into something that that i that i agree mike what's your take on mall rats i mean i kind of feel like it's the to me it's sort of the sweet spot before he like completely sort of you know the, the, mm-hmm. the wee, wee, you know like, yeah you know, yeah, which, yeah 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 uh, that moment it, for me i think was chasing amy um which i also enjoyed really um not a fan of chasing Amy, but uh, huh. no, I think it was fine. Like, I just I don't think it was as good as as Mallrats, and I think that some you know that some of the cri- criticism of it, uh, you know, was is is valid. Um, I still like the movie. I still seen it a bunch of times. I think some of the jokes in that film are some of the funniest jokes he ever wrote. Which um, one? Mallrats? Are we talking about Mallrats? You know, I really enjoyed um, uh, Mallrats, and I thought that in in a lot of ways it was. Um, you know, a good and, and worthy sort of follow up to Clerks. It definitely has a lot of this, like some of the same feel. Um, it helps that you have Jay uh-huh. and Silent Bob there, uh, sort of for continuity. Right, they're kind of the, they're 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 the they're the characters that appear in all of those movies. They give it that continuity. Um, yeah, no, my exactly. my take on yeah, my take on Mallrats is that it's it's a lot like Clerks, except it's in color and it has some big name Hollywood stars and there's a there's a there's a romantic plot put on put into it that that kind of gives you a nice payoff at the end it it's like the hollywood version of clerks um is my yeah, take and on it and uh it's and pg i believe was an r-rated like clerks was um, I, I don't know it might have been probably i cannot remember but i seem to i seem i can't say with all certainty but if i recall correctly which i may not be um, I believe it was the PG one. Could be. I uh, I'm, I'd be willing I, I to have, believe that, or PG thirteen at most, or PG thirteen certainly. Um, and I believe that was like because they were getting big Hollywood. There's a lot of interesting stories behind the production of Mall Rats. Like uh, they weren't originally they were originally going to have Seth the uh, production company wanted to have Seth Green BJ instead of JBJ. Yeah, interesting. I have zero uh, difficulty oh, yeah. believing that, and thank God that didn't uh, happen because that would have been awful. Yeah, no, that <laughs> just wouldn't that would not have worked. Um, that was one of the films where Ben Affleck. I don't know if that's his first film, but it's definitely one where he got a start. And it's like, um, what had happened was, you know, Ben Affleck and that was one uh, of his earlier movies. Yeah, Kevin Smith got to be friends, and Kevin Smith took the script for Goodwill Hunting that. Um, Ben Affleck and what's his face have been working on. Um, what is his name? His buddy in Matt Goodwill. Damon? That's it, 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 Matt, Star- Damon. Matt, Matt Damon. Matt Damon. He took he took that script to the heads of Miramax and said, "Hey, this is a really good script. These two guys have come up with. You should, you know, you should make this movie." And like by him pushing it forward, you know, you got uh, Goodwill Hunting, and then those two got themselves a serious career. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. So yeah, yeah. Cool. Brown. Yeah, that, that, these are all good things. I, that, I have zero difficulty believing all of that because that Kevin Smith strikes me as that kind of guy. Um, and then you got Chasing uh, Amy. So I looked it up. Uh, both Clerks and Mallrats were rated R. Oh, there you oh go. okay. Hmm. There you go. I, I was wrong. Yeah. That happens. Yeah, it happens. Um, I mean, infrequently, but I know. <laughs> Chasing Amy is is a film that um, is a film that I liked a lot when I saw it. I still yeah. probably like it. I think it's got it's got a little more ambition than Mallrats does. It's definitely about something. It, it has something to say. It has it's, a lot of heart. It has a lot of heart, and it's about that. And it's yeah. it's a very genuine film in that. Um, it's definitely of its era, and I think that's fine. Yeah, um, I sure. probably like it a little better than Mallrats because it's a little more. You know, Mallrats feels like a weird sequel to me. Mm. Yeah. It's it feels yeah. like a weird sequel 
and uh, and that's fine. You know, it's not dislike, but Chasing Amy seems to be about something. Um, Chasing Amy, yeah, it touches on a lot of things in my, I mean, you know, comic book industry, mm -hmm. uh, independent comics, certainly. Yeah. Um, but it also touches on some things I think that many people can relate on, and that is when you let your worry of someone's history, their past, interfere with your ability to cope with them in the present because of your own feeling inadequate or how you compare or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a very, it, it's something you can definitely relate to no matter, I think who you are. Yeah, definitely a very relatable film. And it's very open about that. This is what the film is about. Like it, yeah. it puts that whole thing into the, the one silent Bob speech in the, yeah. at the diner. Uh, which I think is is one of the better uh, Jay and Silent Bob scenes in all of the films is the one in Chasing Amy. Yeah, yeah. because because oh. they it gives Silent Bob a lot to say, and I think they that's that kind of opened things up a little bit because uh, normally ben, Silent Bob just mugs and that's fine. Yeah, Ben Affleck's character uh, Holden, appropriately named. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind yeah, of call out J D. Salinger right there. Yeah. Let's um, all call out J D. Salinger. But I think one of the things that always I used to talk to, uh, I can't remember who I used to, but I used to talk about this film. I was like, the thing about Holden is that Holden in the critical scene in that is kind of a fucking bonehead. Yeah. Like yeah. his solution to this problem <laughs> with his best friend and his girlfriend and his problem with his girlfriend's basketball is a bonehead answer. It's the worst like, idea in the history of bad ideas. Like, that, <laughs> like, okay, that's an answer, but that's an answer that only works with a jazz soundtrack and a pizza delivery boy, okay? <laughs> if you get my guest here. Like, is your name Carl Hunger? Like, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Maybe your name's Michael Moorcock. I don't know what to tell you, but uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I'm like that. That's not. I mean, but again, if you have no experience in these matters, and I guess you're from Jersey, I would definitely think being from Jersey definitely feeds into this from my experiences. Um, that seems like a perfectly legitimate answer to that situation this is what we need to do so that this isn't a problem anymore i i, I present the problem and he, and he presents it to them like he's like he's uh like he's trying to sell them on a on a kleenex ad or something like he's don <laughs> draper <laughs> he like, calls was, a meeting i'm surprised he doesn't have like placards that's what i was thinking demonstrate like, what's a happening whiteboard, a whiteboard out here so oh, it's time to right here <laughs> and then here and just be here and if we have a threesome it'll fix everything i'm like <laughs> it's never <laughs> Never in the history of ever of anything has a history been a solution. Has a threesome been a solution to a relationship problem? Uh, no, never. No. It's, oh, never. It's, it's right up God. there with having. It's right up there with having the save the relationship baby. Also, does yeah. not right. work. Yeah, does not does work. Does not work. Or opening up the relationship to save it does not. work. Work. No. Opening the door to leaving. Yes. Yeah. Opening yes. the door to leaving. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. But it is a heartfelt. But it's realistic in that people do dumb shit like that. People do. Like everything. Every scene in that movie. Um. Even the same Jay and Silent Bob scene, which normally is something that plays across, is very weird because these are these are characters yeah. and they're very yeah. extreme characters. But everything comes across as very genuine and. uh and has realism to it. Like that's, that's the great thing about his art, mm -hmm. his oh, yeah. films when they're good is they, he, he does the thing where he, he writes people how they talk. Yeah, he does. He does. Absolutely. Tarantino like, doesn't do that. He, no, he, he, he elevates everything. Everything is theatrical and it's sort of, it's like, it's a weird Hollywood realism. It's entertaining. It's witty. It's clever. And it has some realism in that people just talk about dumb stuff randomly, but nobody really talks that way. Uh, no one, no one is ever that fucking witty, unscripted. No, 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 no one is ever that witty, unscripted. I, though there, there are definitely some gems in chasing. What's it? What's a Nubian bitch? I almost <laughs> laugh. <laughs> it's not only the line itself; it's just the way he stands up and says, "Like, 
like this innocent one. What's a Nubia? <laughs> black rage, black rage, black rage. <laughs> hey, I'll be your victim, and I can be your catcher. Right, Q, right, Q, right. Q, Jay and Silent Bob strike, uh, strike back. Yeah, but before that, before yeah. we get to Jay and Silent Bob strike back, we got to do Dogma. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I was just referencing that. That calls back to that later. Yeah, yeah. Which weirdly is the one film that you can't seem to find on like iTunes. Dogma. You can't. Mm. You can find all of his original, like what I call the 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 five like yeah. classic Kevin Smith films. Those five, mm. um, up from Clerks to the first Jane Silent Bob movie. But Dogma is the one you can't find on iTunes. Huh. Which is yeah, that might have to do strange. Oh, well. I remember now that is one that I know that me and you, Mike, did see in the theater. Yeah, we did go and see. I that recall one. we went to go. I see saw that, that in the one. theater too when it came out, and I that was that to me was like Dogma is the film that really kind of shows his weaknesses, like his weaknesses as a filmmaker. That which is going to circle back around to the point I want to make about him. That is that is way too big a concept, I think, for his style. It's definitely. He's, oh, to use a comic book analogy, it's like putting the Punisher, who's a street level hero, quote unquote, and making him fight fucking Thanos. <laughs> you can't make the Punisher fight Thanos. That is out of his depth. And I understand that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I, that's, we're, we're, I mean, Kevin Smith has always had like the he's he's definitely got the raised Catholic vibe running through his films. It's definitely present in Chasing Amy, but he does not have the depth to tell this story well. He digs a little bit. There's a there's one or two good lines. Um, you know, tell people you're the Metatron. They stare at you blankly. Mention something from a Charlton Heston film, and suddenly everyone's a theologian. <laughs> yeah. uh, that that's a good line. That's a good line. Um, I feel I feel that definitely his the cast he was able to get for that helped certainly carry that film because Alan Rickman scenery chewing at its best. Yeah, I mean Alan Rickman elevates everything he's in. You got George Carlin in it. You got Chris Rock in it, <laughs> and like, yeah, George Carlin and Chris Rock are fucking funny. I mean, there there's no way around that. Yeah, George Carlin did a really good turn in that film, uh, playing an archbishop. I think he did. I think he he hit that note just right. <laughs> Cynical, but not over the top. And I, I think that that note worked really well. Um, I'm not sold on the the Chris Rock character is fine. But it's it's kind of what I'm getting to. There's a, there's a real lack of depth to that joke. You know, it's like he's the thirteenth apostle. Why is he the thirteenth apostle? Cause he's black. And of right. course, we, that wouldn't be. But it's like not in the first well, century, dude. In, Nobody in would have century. cared about the first mm-hmm. century. Like there were African Roman emperors. Like Saint Augustine was African. Like no one would have cared. I mean, it, Israel pretty much is in half. I'm shit. My no, no it's damn not. close to it. It's, damn close to it, though. It's not, but it's in the Middle East, so yeah, like, it's I mean, kind of in that liminal area. But that's it. Te- would have been technically. Fun, it would have been more. It would have been more historically accurate to say, "Oh, if he was p- pale white, that would have stood out." Yeah, yeah, that would have. A, de- a Celtic that would've, apostle would have been in more trouble. A whole lot more, but that's but, a that's a whole other thing. But it 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 speaks to like the lack of depth. Like pretty much all the, yeah. the religious jokes in Dogma are like, let's take this difficult religious concept and reduce it. God plays skee ball. God plays skee ball. That's the joke. In Jersey, yeah. Angels drink tequila. That's the joke. But they got to spit it out. Yeah. <laughs> because they can't drink anymore. Right, right, because right. Loki <laughs> got drunk as fuck and told God what he thought, gave God the finger, and threw down his flaming sword. It's right, like, right, right. Which is a cool a, concept. That's a cool concept. My favorite line from uh, from that movie is the, like, I rained down sulfur. That's the most exhausting thing there is to do. It's next to soccer. Next to play soccer, yeah. That's my favorite line as well, Mike. <laughs> and and Damon delivers it just so like flat and matter of factly that it's perfect. The the Matt Damon and Ben Affleck scenes are probably the best things in Dogma. 
Yeah. Just they, because, they do a good job. Just because they're just... You can tell that it's just them bickering the way that they bicker. Like, who's, this is from someone who still owes me a, a, a bet about uh, who was going to do more E.T. or Crush Groove. Like, <laughs> that <laughs> kind of time like... Will tell. <laughs> that's... <laughs> Hey, look, time will tell. It's like, whose house? Run. Run's house. house. <laughs> like, you can tell that, that that wasn't in the script. That's just ba- Affleck and Damon yeah. riffing. And Kevin Smith was like, fine with it. Just do that. That's just them being them. And that's fine. But you are right. I do think, I think that uh, Dogma definitely is him exceeding his grasp. Well, yeah. You know, it also kind of reminded me more of, like, the, the, the comics stuff that he's written. Um, ah, and, yeah. and I think... And I think that, you know, the story in Dogma, um, he could have made that work in a comic book, actually. Yeah, um, sure. But like in the film, like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I think I think what you guys said was was correct in that the the cast really helped carry that film. And like the fact that he was in that transition towards Hollywood, he could get all of these great actors. Like, I mean, Salma Hayek was in there as well. Um, you know, I mean, she's amazing. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, he, just, he had this great you know, cast of characters in there. Um, and, you know, they were able to carry it. But I agree, it's not really... It's it's kind of a shallow movie. I mean, you know, there's a lot of great banter in it, like all of his... Like, like pretty much all of his movies have. But um, conceptually, it... Eh. Yeah. 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 And there's there's one thing that always sticks out to me, like the, the whenever I watch that, and it's been a while since I have. I think the second or third time that I saw it, you get to the end, and, and somebody's, like, one of the angels, one of the bad angels' chest explodes. And that is, without a doubt, one of the worst special effect transitions I've <laughs> ever seen in a major Hollywood film. It's B-movie level. <laughs> how bad it is. How poor... It's so... This is obviously a dummy, and it, it it's not shot the same way. It's not on line right. It just... It looks bad i i feel the god Gol- 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 and shit demon is a better special effect of that movie than the exploding angel yeah, yeah that was that's... i'd forgotten about that i'd forgotten about the Golgothan, and that was um yeah, that's, that's clever that was fun that's, that was fucking clever too if you think about it well i think uh dogma was also the movie where he was trying to answer some of the criticism that he'd received in his prior films where a lot of the shots a lot of the the actual scenes were very flat because you essentially mm-hmm. just had like two or however many people against a wall yeah. you know jawing looks at each like other. a play yeah right um so he was he definitely tried to do more in terms of the cinematography i think in in dogma and there's there's some different uh you know shots that he tries to do which i, I think was a good move um yeah you know and That's i think fine like, you know, to develop but, your craft is always a good idea, but it it yeah, doesn't. Yeah. It's 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 definitely like uh, growing pains, and that would be fine if he moved past it. But I don't I don't know that he ever did. Um, well, in the Askewiverse, he only did three more films. He did yeah. After that was James Hunt Pop Strike Back, then Clerks two, then. The reboot, Jane Silent Bob reboot, and then I think Mulrats 2 is coming and possibly Clerks 3. Oh, but God. whatever. Um, I got about 40 minutes into the Jane Silent Bob reboot, and I was bored. Haven't seen I got it. bored. Like, when, 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 as soon as, like, Jay has the scene, spoilers, where he meets his daughter, which is quite clearly played by Jason Mewes' actual daughter. I, I, I feel it's like, like it's actually... Ca- it's Kevin Smith's dog. Oh well, then that's uh, fine. Okay. That's fine. That's right. But I like. I got. I just got. I, I didn't want to go anymore. <laughs> it was, I, uh, it's I got a pretty good it. payoff. Okay, it's got a pretty good payoff. I, I watched it all the way through. Um, but I had an idea of what to expect in it. Mm-hmm. Um, going into it, um, and you get a really. You get a really from that relationship of he meets his daughter. You get a really good emotional payoff at the end of the film on that. Like that, okay. that all that setup. It may seem slow and a bit monotonous, but there is definitely a payoff at the end. All of right. it. Let's let's. I'll be that as it may. Be that as it may. We'll stick a pin in that. But uh, right, stick a pin in that. But then let's since you brought it up, let's talk about the Jane Silent Bob movie, the Jane Silent Bob Strike Back film. Um, which I saw another movie I saw in the theater and liked it a lot when I saw it, but have come to hate. Mm. 
Hmm. Because I feel like that's the moment where it's basically uh, a, a view askew fan service thing. Yeah. And it's like, let's have all the references to all the things. I wasn't even supposed to be here today. Like, I knew I was going to hate the Jan Son Bob movie when that was like the first line or I... You see Dante, and you know before five minutes are out that he has to say that movie, he ha- or that he has to say that line, and it's just it's just become obligatory. And right. it's oh. it's it's a little it's like it's it's Palpatine as the villain in Rise of Skywalker. It's 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 sort of like <sighs> part of the background behind that movie. Um, and mind you, I've seen it a few times, um, but the distance, but the, the distance. Part of the thing about it is that part of the background is Kevin Smith made the Jay and Silent Bob strike back as an attempt to clean up his good buddy, Jason Mewes, who he said, all right, look, we can make another, I'll make another film, but you got to clean up. I cannot, you got to get clean so we can do this film. You know, it was basically an attempt to get his buddy clean and sober. Um, and I so respect I that. That's, that's valid. You know. But I do feel that the film. I think you're. I do believe your observations are correct because it wasn't really a film that came about organically. No, you know, it's a film that came about uh, as well. Shit. Okay, I got. We need to do a thing. Let's do all the things. You know, yeah. let's kind of let's go completely meta, and it's fine to see it the first time. But it's it's fan service. It's mm-hmm. it's Force Awakens. It's not even Force Awakens. It's Rogue One. <laughs> I can make all the Star Wars references I want. We're talking about Kevin Smith. I, I liked Rogue One. I didn't. Well, I have to have a distance, of, have have a distance of opinion on that one. I, mean, I, liked um, it. I liked it fine, and I liked Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back fine, but I've only, I've only seen both of those movies once, and I don't yeah, know, same here. And I don't same know here. that I'll necessarily sit through them again. Yeah. Um, you know, I do think. I mean, that... I do got Jane Silent Bob on uh, Struck Back on DVD, but I don't even watch it that often. Yeah, no, I, I thought know. it was really funny at the time, and like some of the references. So were did I. Good. And I mean, like their motivation is essentially just to find out who's talking shit about them on the internet, so they can go to those people's houses and punch them in the face. Which, like, like that part's great. <laughs> that the, again, the concept is great. Like the fact that these two stoners are mad that someone's talking about them on the internet. And and goes and beats them all up. That's wonderful. I love that idea. I don't like the fact that, you know, Mark Hamill shows up at the end and is like, look, kids, it's Mark Hamill. It's like, I get the joke you're making, but you're still, like, just shoving him in for no good reason just because. I, I think it shows a real just, like, like you said, like, I just need to make this movie just f- to make this movie, you know. I just need I, to I make do... it. I do feel that the movie following it was certainly Clerks Two was certainly I think stronger, but that was that was still a while not, later, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that was a while later. That was a good deal while Five later. Five or and six I think years came, later, came about a good deal more organically. I mean, you throw in a, I mean, the, yeah, James and I mean, there's a lot of funny individual moments, and the individual moments work, but strung together as an overall meta plot yeah uh, not not as much not as much there's no reason for characters from chasing amy to be in that movie right because we're gonna do that we're gonna reference all the things and they're gonna be a gay couple um which make that makes sense like that's yeah given what happens in in chasing amy that just makes sense perfect that's uh, fine that's where i was mentioned the looping back to that like that that oh i like okay that's a good little loop back but um it's just remember this Right. Do you remember this? Do you remember Banky? It's we it, haven't seen since. Uh, I mean, Mallrats. Or am I confusing? No, characters? chasing Amy. Chasing Amy. Banky's chasing the guy. Amy, right, right. Banky. All right, right, right. Chasing Amy. Well, who was the other? Who was the character that Jason Scott Lee played in? Um, fucking uh, Mallrats. Then. Uh, oh, he's also in the Jay and Silent Bob reboot. That's um. Yeah. What's that character's name? It's the same Brody. actor, but Brody. Brody, thank you. I keep coming. Br- Branky, Brody, Brody, yeah. Brody, yeah. And they're see, both, like, they're both played by Jason Lee, so yeah, you can confuse. Well, he's those. essentially Jason Lee as Jason Lee as. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I might do a funny little aside here, 
Um, I came to the because Jason Lee before he became an actor apparently was a pro skater. Oh, like okay. no, I can see that. <laughs> I can, like okay. he was a really, really good pro skater, okay. made money off of it. And then I stop and I think about that, and he became a, a movie star. And then I think about that, having seen Scott Pilk when Scott Pilgrim came out, they had the character Lucas Lee, who's a pro skater turned movie star, oh, paid by Captain America. Right. And I just made that. I made that connection not long ago. Wait, 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 wait. Jason Lee. Lucas Lee. Ah. Ah. And he's got the same and he's got the same attitude as, as Jason Lee. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. That's a movie I've enjoyed more as I continue to rewatch it. Scott Pilgrim versus Scott the Pilgrim, World. Scott Pilgrim's got a lot it of heart gets, in it. It gets too. better as I watch it. It was a little weird and I wasn't sure I was getting it the first time, and it's a little it's a little over the top. But yeah. as I've rewatched it, I, I've enjoyed it more. Um so that's like the the big five that that came out. And that was that was the era in which Kevin Smith was, you know, the person whose movies you went to see because he made them. Yeah, when he yeah. had not quite the same level as Cachet as Tarantino, but he was he was it's a Kevin Smith movie. Go see a Kevin Smith movie. Yeah. Like that's what I remember for for Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. I went with my buddy. It's like we're gonna go see. We're gonna go see this, right? Like, right? Yes, yeah. Yes, we are. And we went. We loved it. But and after that, Jersey Girl. Yeah. Jersey Girl. I never saw it. Which, I refused to never see it. seen, never desired to see, like, oh, it's J-Lo and Ben Affleck. Nope. Why would you watch that? Why would you watch that movie? I don't care about... It's a rom-com. It's a yeah. straight-up rom-com. And, oh, and people said, no, it's actually not bad. And let's stipulate that it's not. Let's stipulate that it's it's a perfectly serviceable film. But anyone can do a fucking rom com and a serviceable rom com. Who cares? Yeah, like what, what's the what what look? I lived through the fucking eighties and saw films in the eighties and early nineties. I am rom comed up, man. Like, yeah. If I never see another goddamn rom com again, because every rom com in my brain is just what's his name holding up the boombox, playing your eyes. Okay, <laughs> that's it to me. That is that's a pretty good movie. <laughs> it is a very good movie. <laughs> It's a very good movie, it's but that is yep. but that is the beginning and ending of rom coms for me. That's a good movie. All right. Actually, one for me that I do like is with Steve Martin, Roxanne, and Bell oh Hannah. well, rock. That's okay. Roxanne is fantastic. And Roxanne Splash, is, I'll give Splash that. Roxanne is basically Rock. Cyrano de Bergerac. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, oh no, absolutely, it is exactly it's, it's that. Straight up Cyrano de Bergerac. Yeah. But it's a classic. It's that's that's one of those f- films that like my parents had on bought on video VHS tape and we watched all the time. And I'm I like mean, 40s, and me and my parents will just quote that movie at each other all the time. It must be wonderful to wake up in the morning and smell the coffee in Brazil. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's like look, it's like why you can't hate the ten things I the ten things I hate about you. It's the taming I mean, of the true, shrew. Uh, they never do taming of the shrew. So that's Jersey Girl. Let's let's not say anything more about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then because we can't because we didn't see it, so we're just we're just we're just pooping on the genre rather than the film. But yeah. it, it goes to like, why did he do that? What's the point? And uh, maybe, maybe he was trying to refine himself as a as a director, but in doing so, he removed everything that was unique from his directorial and artistic voice. I mean, you know, so. So I'll say this. I, I always felt like him doing that film was him trying to reach for a broader appeal, and he didn't understand that he already had it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, he didn't, I don't think he understood at the time that he was already there. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, he could have essentially just done any kind of movie, you know, that was not a rom com. Uh, but he, like, he essentially <laughs> could have just done anything. And, it, you know, that was like a, a, a mainstream, like, this is a you know this is a film you know sit down and watch it. Um, it didn't mm-hmm. have to be like within the the, the view skewiverse, but I think he I, was just reaching for broader appeal and he he already had it. I hate that name by the way, view skewiverse. I hate it. I don't mind that it exists. I hate that it's branded <laughs> by a pantsless clown. Um, <laughs> that's fine. That's a logo. That was in Clerks. It's fine. <laughs> I, I have issues with clowns. Uh, not I don't. I'm not afraid of them. I just have issues with them. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, like um, clowns in real life are dicks. Generally, like you kind of have to be a dick to be a clown. Like this is your profession. You're like, oh yeah, no. I get into the clown car every morning and I go out and I clown. And we're like, 
Congratulations. You are probably a dick. You have to go to school for that. Oh, no. serious, you have to go to school and you have to go to clown college and they're dicks to you. And you're like, here's how you're dicks as clowns. And you're like, oh, I've learned so much knowledge. I'll put on my nose and go forth and be dicks to people. No, it's, Can you yeah, imagine the, what's, what's the full metal jacket clown scene? <laughs> Arlie Ermy with, with a big clown get up now. <laughs> Just like Ronald motherfucking McDonald. <laughs> Uh, Your name is Private Pie Pants. Do you like that name? <laughs> sir, yes, sir. <laughs> call you the Hamburglar. No, sir, I do not like this. Tough check, you're the Hamburglar. Yeah, not you know. this is my <laughs> This is my horn. There are many like it, but this one is mine. <laughs> uh, uh, we're all imagining it, and it keeps getting better. <laughs> but I, I do think... I, I do think I have a little bit of insight on what happened with Kevin Smith. Um, and in some ways it kind of parallels what I did with my career for years. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, um, I have a very distinctive style. Okay. It is not for everyone, but the people it's for, it's fucking for. And I have found my work that I've done that's been the weakest is when I try to go for broad appeal, for mm-hmm. conformity, for everyone will like this, for business safe. And when I do that, my work ends up subpar. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's there. I guess it's okay. I mean, it represents something. Meh. But nobody's ever going to stop and take a look at some of that kind of work and go, oh, wow, that, that that's really my thing. And I think that's what happened with Kevin Smith. I think he got, like, afraid of, well, shit, I mean, I'm good at this oddball shit, but who's ever going to look at this oddball shit? I need to try to appeal to more people. And... I feel that very strongly at this point, when you go away from the thing that makes you, your, your artistic voice unique and don't develop it and don't try to take it further and instead try to go for safe, you lose a lot. And that is what Tarantino did not do. Tarantino leaned into his weird shit straight further he did into Jackie it. Brown. It confused the entire everyone's expectations, but he did it. And in kind of in some ways, that's kind of like Jersey Girl, but because mm. it's like it's just it's just this this basic film. Like there, yeah. there's, well, it's, but yeah. you can watch probably watch Jersey Girl again. And but I don't even have interest in seeing Jersey Girl. Here's the thing: I didn't get to see Jackie Brown in the in the theaters, but I definitely watched it on video. Like, yeah, this is. Okay, it's different, but I'm digging it. Yeah. If for nothing else, it's got a good soundtrack, but I'm digging it. Great and upon future rewatching it, like, okay, okay, I'm seeing some more of the depth here. And yeah, this is definitely a Tarantino film. Mm-hmm. You know, but I feel that artistically, if you have a shtick, let us just say a shtick, but shtick is a good word. If you have a shtick, lean into it, develop it. I agree. And I think yeah. that's what Kevin Smith did not do. No, he did not. He He did not. Kind of tried to play it safe, I agree. Yeah, and I mean, Jack, like a lot of people were confused by Jackie Brown, um, but it was a a definitely, like like I sort of said before, a very loving homage to a particular subgenre of film that was very prevalent in the 70s. Um, Yeah. And he he hits all the, you know, hits all the points, checks all the boxes in that genre. Um, And then you have Kevin Smith, who has done you know, Jersey girl. And, you know, I'm guessing it's a fairly by the numbers rom-com. I can't, I can't speak to it cause I haven't seen it. Uh, Neither have I, but I, I never, I never heard any, I saw any clips from it or any advertisements for it or any of it spoke to me that it was going to be where like, Oh, well, I mean, this isn't Kevin Smith. What is this? If right. it had been a Kevin Smith oddball view askew take on a rom-com, but I feel like that was, he already did that. He already chasing did Amy. That. Yeah, was chasing Amy. that was chasing Amy. And Chasing Amy was great as a rom-com because Guy don't get the girl at the end because he he's a bonehead and he made a bonehead decision. And on a larger level, it, they didn't work as a couple. No, no, they didn't they fit together. To. They didn't they didn't fit it as a couple, and they didn't. You know, they were they had a, they had a connection. They had something real, but it wasn't enough to sustain the relationship. No, and the problem and, that they had as people overwhelmed that. And the film says, and you know what? That's okay. Mm-hmm. Because and in the, rom-coms, you don't get that. In no. the end of Chasing Amy, they're all okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. They're not like hanging out being best friends anymore, but they're all fine. They're all still people. They're living their lives. They're moving on. They've learned something from the experience. Mm-hmm. It's that's realism and that's worth saying. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yes. Um, I mean, and that how- is also not in the rom-com formula, which is, oh, guy makes boneheaded mistake, but girl forgives him and they get back together and they all live happily ever. That doesn't happen. Doesn't you make a boneheaded happen. mistake like that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe things work. Maybe, maybe you get forgiven. You never get forgiven. That shit does still gets brought up at dinner or maybe in the, you know, drive through at dry, McDonald's for some reason or other. I, who knows? Um, it's going to randomly come or, up. Yeah, no. It's going to randomly come up and you're going to catch shit for it still. Yeah. And that and that's real life. Well, so, yeah. And I mean, I liked Chase, the end of Chasing Amy because it's like, yeah, you know, um, sometimes relationships just end. Yeah. Like that's a real thing that happens all the time. Yeah. And it's okay. That's okay. It's not the end of yeah. the world. And it's okay. Yeah. You know? So that was... Let's, um, we've kind of wandered, but we keep, uh, I think we're making good points here. Uh, yeah. so I think we've kind of made the, the comparison between him and Tarantino, uh, yeah. which is that Tarantino like developed, developed his, his oeuvre and Kevin Smith didn't Ke- Tarantino yeah. leaned into his, into his work and is therefore, it didn't remain same. He's continually developing it. Like there's yeah. a, there's a, there's stuff in once upon a time in Hollywood that isn't oh. in Reservoir Dogs. Once there, upon a time in Hollywood was just uh, that was so beautiful to me. He keeps getting better. That was so beautiful to me. He like, keeps his movies get better. Like when I went to go see that, and uh, me and Mike picked yeah, we that, saw, uh, that, saw yeah. that one. We went to saw we saw that one, and um, you know I'm like, and I was nervous about seeing it because I had you know I heard the character Margaret Roby was playing. I'm like, oh, this movie's gonna not end well if he's going by history. But then I had forgotten that. The hit, um, what do you call it? Tarantino has his own alternate history. Inglorious Bastards, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> and so what actually happens at that film as opposed to what happened in real life, you know, doesn't happen, and it makes me feel better. Anyone it order some fried feel- sauerkraut? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel better because Tarantino could have leaned into the gore of those terrible, terrible mur- murders. He could have done it. He could have done a sensationalized bit of that, but he chose not. He did lean into the gore. I mean, it's a, violent. It's but violent. It's not. I don't know. But not in the direction that he could have, and most directors would have. Yeah, that's true. yeah. Like most directors would have played up the Manson murder mm-hmm. aspect of that movie, something fierce for their last quarter sure. bit, but. You know that wouldn't have been that wouldn't have really been a very good film, and it definitely wouldn't have been the film we got. And the beautiful thing about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is it is you know there's several tales going on, but I think the most important tale is the redemption of Jack Dalton. Mm. Yes, as both an actor and as a person. Yes, yeah, it's fantastic. It's it's. Probably one of the favorite things I've ever seen Leonardo DiCaprio in. Yo, yeah. And I'm not really a fan of him as an actor. Nothing against him, but it's just, you know. I um, like him okay. I liked a lot of the stuff he did with Scorsese. Mm. Um, so we, we're, we're now talking about other directors again who have made Sorry. better and more interesting films. No, but that kind of goes to the point about we, we really lose track of where, of where Kevin Smith has gone. And I think it's fair to say that he kind of leaned into some other stuff. We said earlier, he's probably way more like, important as a podcaster than it is as a filmmaker. He also does good work on the small screen because he's directed a lot of the CW's uh, DC TV universe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, he's done some flash episodes. He's done some Supergirl episodes. Um, and I've seen some of them. That's a good job. Like the comic book medium, he's pretty good in. Okay. Oh, for sure. Um, I do. I do have one thing I'll say. So that one thing that I think both uh, Smith and Tarantino have going for them is they're great at like banter and dialogue. Yeah. Yes. Um, those yes. are definitely definite strengths for both of them. Um, yes. I think they're both the, writers. No. Yeah. They both are, and uh, they're both talkers. Like. No, absolutely. And um, I just think that, like, so th- that's, like, a strength for both of them. I just think with, with Smith, it's been 
you know, Tarantino has these other things that he's trying to do. He has these other influences or other story elements that he's trying to, that he's actually trying to tell. Whereas, you know, Kevin Smith is sort of like, all right, well, I'm going to have these characters and they're just going to kind of. Well, <laughs> and the funny thing about Smith is he'll be the first to tell you that eh, I'm kind of a hack job of a director. And right, I mean, I, you know, I'm not like, um, one of his podcasts, which is Fat Man Beyond, it's called Fat Man Beyond since he lost the weight from after the heart attack. Um, of course, it's called that. It was his original, like, pop culture, comic book, sci fi movie podcast. And he's on it with a guy named Mark uh, Bernardino, who uh, they're both working together to write the new Master of the Universe cartoon. And Mark cool. will come up, will say something, because a longtime journalist and writer will say these various ideas and things. And Kevin will stop and be like, Shit, see, I wish I would have thought like something like that for my movies because I would never have thought that far, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I will give you know, again, like his movies, he's definitely, definitely not doing as great in movies as he used to, but I do believe, at least as far as a person and a recognizer of other talent, that he gives credit sure. where credit is due, absolutely. Um, and he at least recognizes his own limitations. And I will say this: I'll say this. There is nothing worse than a director or writer who is unaware of their own goddamn limitations. True facts. I, I, I agree with that. And that's kind of the point I want to go to next. Um, I mentioned Bukowski, mm. who is a character and an individual and a person probably as completely unlike Kevin Smith as you could possibly imagine. I and am I, familiar. He's he's a he's a writer and a, a poet. He's something of an enfant terrible. He's the oh, kind of yeah. guy who who got he became. I mean, he was a he was basically a bum for like decades, like a bum and a drunk and a layabout in and out of the drunk tank in prison. But all the while, you know, living in various places, um, he's a bum, and he wrote poetry. He was always a writer of poetry, and he would send poetry off. Like, he's an educated man. He was just an educated man who refused to have any interest in working for a living. I mean, working for a living is some bullshit. I'm not going to lie. Right. Um, but he, he and then he wrote a book called Post Office in the 60s, which was basically an autobiographical okay, yeah. account of him working for the post office for a long time. And it is a one it's it's called a novel. It's basically creative nonfiction. I mean, he mm. gives himself a pseudonym, but this is his life. He wrote his life in as a story. And he probably um you know probably edited it here and there. I'm getting some real Albert Camus vibes off this. Right. Definitely. Definitely. And he probably would have been the first to admit that because he he's the kind of guy who read Camus and French existentialist. He's been on French television or was on French television and he got wasted and tried to paw the female guests and had to be escorted out of the building. And this is after he got famous, but he got famous for this book called post office. And then he wrote several other books in that style. And all the while also writing more poetry. And once post office took off, he became a widely known poet, the kind of guy that did poetry readings and he would sit there and get drunk and read his poetry and sometimes do good readings and sometimes do bad readings. And then he would write a poem about how well the poetry reading went and his, uh, his writing style is very raw and basic. It's it's almost like folk music mm. or the blues. It's it's just what it is. Mm. And okay. he finds both the comedy he minds the comedy and tragedy and the tragedy and comedy. And it's very plain, but I like it. But he didn't get to be well known or famous until he was older than we are, older than I am. Almost that middle happens. Aged. Almost that happens. middle-aged. At which point, he was set in his ways. And he wasn't oh, going to yeah. change for anyone. And he didn't. Like, oh, they yeah. made a movie about one of his books. It was called uh, Barfly. Oh, it's yeah. not a oh bad, I recall that one. Barfly, not a bad movie. I I finally saw it. And he did write a, a, a book about that whole experience. It was called Hollywood. But he didn't change. He didn't go Hollywood. His art never changed. He remained what it was and what he is. Because why, he, didn't why, get, he didn't get famous until he was almost 50. Why am I connecting Barfly to that movie I saw over at your place, uh, Mike, with Joaquin Phoenix about the uh, – it had Thanos oh, in it too. You're thinking of uh, Thomas Pynchon, uh, um, yeah, Advice. 
Yes, yes. Why why am I connecting the inherent vice to Barfly? Help me out different here. Because I don't think authors. I yeah. different authors. Uh They're different authors, but for some reason I'm connecting them in my head thematically. They also did uh they did a movie of one of uh Dukowski's films in the nineties or more recently that uh Factotum. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They did yeah. do that. I haven't seen it, but they with, did with that. Matt they did Dillon. That. Yeah, I, Matt, I would like... Matt Dillon is plays the lead, and it's it's a pretty faithful account of what goes on in in Factotum. In fact, Toto is about his years getting jobs and working and quitting jobs and getting drunk. As a quick aside, I would like to point out that the term "enfant terrible" reminds me all too much of preacher. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's fair. Mike knows why. That's fine. Um. Anyway, so Bukowski. Is is art is very plain, very basic. You either like it or you don't. There's 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 very little there's very little to it but the truth mm-hmm. and an attempt to evoke the truth about you know see the seedy underbelly of life, which is what he lived in. I mean, you know, write what you know. Yeah. Right, right, and that's what Kevin Smith did in Clerks. He okay. did. He did. That is Clerks. Clerks is like a Bukowski film in that respect. It's nothing more than the day in the life of a guy who's not supposed to be there today. And stuff happens, but it's not like ridiculous stuff. It's just, you know, the kind of stuff that's totally grounded and would totally happen. Yeah. Stuff that you could totally see happening. The playing of the the hockey game on the roofs, a little out there, but totally within the bounds of plausibility. Everything that happens in that movie is plausible and there's there's a like with Bukowski's uh, work. There's there's a, an awareness of education, but it's 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 and an and an, uh, an ambition towards art, but it's it's played it's played close to the chest, and it's no mm. more than what it is. Kevin Smith was 23 when he made that movie. That's true, and I think I was that same age or close to it when I saw it. Yeah, he was, um, he was born in 1970, Kevin Smith. And yeah, he was, yeah. that was 1993, he was 23 years old, and he was famous. So I saw that movie three years after he made it then. Yeah. Um, he, was, he was famous. And, and then it, Hollywood came, and Hollywood... Hollywooded and he, him. Hollywood Hollywooded him, and he became mm-hmm. Hollywood, and he changed. And the spark that made him, could have made him continue as a vital filmmaker, was sucked dry. And I don't know I submit that I to agree you, with that. I submit to you... That if he had made Mallrats and Chasing Amy on the same budget with the same actors that he made Clerks with, those films would be better. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, if he that... kept, if he, if Mallrats was black and white, mm. if Chasing Amy was black and white, without, I mean, nothing against Jason Lee or, or Ben Affleck, but those guys, like we said, those guys weren't known. No, they were not. Um... If, if it, if it had stayed in New Jersey. And he just kind of kept making those kind of films. I think his films would be better. I think that I don't know about that because I don't know that necessarily the access to money and talent necessarily became a crutch for him. But I will say that. So I've watched a few documentaries on him. Recently, in preparation for this, good for you. Um, hey, I thought it was going to be a test. Okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought there'd be a pop quiz. What do you want, man? Um, True or false? No, no, no. no. <laughs> but you know, I look at how he used to interact and promote himself, and that and interview back during the time of like let's say chasing Amy on. Mm -hmm. And I've seen his stuff, watch his interviews and listen to his podcast since mostly after the heart attack, but a little bit before. Um, And his gift for gab and carrying a conversation and a, you know, and telling a really good story has massively improved. Now, I don't know if this would translate into his movie making. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, just like, you know, Henry Rollins is a tremendously great spoken word guy. That doesn't translate in him, into him making any more music or anything or making great music. But he's a pretty good um, actor, too. 
He is he pretty is good actor. Yeah. I, I just like re- him. I just rewatched He Never Died. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good one. I haven't seen he that. Never uh, Died. Oh yeah, that's nice. a good. That's, that's on my list. He yeah. does. It's a great <laughs> movie. Oh, it is. It is. It's okay. it's it's uh. All right. If remember how much you like John died at the end, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike. Go watch He Never right. Died. On yeah, it. you'll like it. You'll like it. You, you would definitely like it. You are correct. I also liked when Johnny Mnemonic, you want to be perfectly honest. Spider. Yeah. yeah. He's he's got a he's got a great persona and he knows how to play it. And he also know how knows how to like dial it back. So I think he's yeah. he's skilled as a performer, which yes. makes sense because that's what made you know Black Flag so vital. And but he does a very good job as, you know, his career as he's not making punk music anymore, but he definitely has a good career as a spoken word and storyteller and kevin smith definitely has at this point a i mean like i said he's doing superhero shows and shit like that but yeah i feel his spoken word i mean if he can find a way to take that gift of informing and talking and telling a good yarn and translate it back into his writing maybe not direct shit no more Mm -hmm. but into his writing i think I think he could make really, really good movies again. Not Tarantino level, because Tarantino has been taking all this time to hone his craft to a razor sharpness. And Kevin Smith, you know, yeah, been Kevin Smithing. Tarantino's seven years older than um, Kevin Smith. He was born in '63, mm-hmm. so he yeah, was but... he was at the t- he was he was at the tail end of his twenties when he got famous. So again, yeah. his persona was was more formed set. and set and wanted set. the thing. Like when you're famous at 23, you're gonna do what they tell you because and your personality isn't quite set yet. Like I, I heard a you don't know no different. Yeah, I heard a psychological a theory in psychology that your persona or personality at earliest sets at 30. Yeah. Like who you're going to be, 30 is the earliest you're going to get that. And in many cases, it is as late as 35. Hmm. Um, I mean... In ancient Rome, really, that's when you were an adult. You don't really develop your sense of self strongly enough that it's hard to influence. That's why the military takes them young, because you're, you're an adult theoretically but you yeah. aren't set yet and you're reprogrammable it's why they don't draft <laughs> older people or take older people into the military because can you i mean honestly you both can you picture either way one of you two picture me in boot camp and the shit i would have to say back no it would no. it would go poorly ass whoopings would happen and yeah. i would not be the victor in any of those yeah no 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 so but it would go poorly. Yeah, and that's yeah. not even just an aspect of my personality so much as it is oh, at a certain age, you are set. In, like you said, you are set in your fucking ways, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and you are not likely changing for anyone unless a severely traumatic event comes along and you have yeah. a moment of clarity yeah. and then you change your shit, which does happen. But well, and I think, you know, all of this sort of speaks to character. And this is sort of something we were we were talking about earlier, um, you know, or it's related to the dialogue um, where you have yeah. you need, like both Tarantino and Smith are both really good at dialogue. And I will say that I think Kevin Smith is very good at being true to his characters. He may not yes. always put them in the best yes. stories. The stories mm-hmm. may not be the most solid, but everything that comes out of his character's mouths is, is you're like, yeah, no, that's exactly what they would say. That's it's that, that is in character. It's truthful. Yeah. Okay. It's truthful. So like, I do feel like he's, he does like one thing that he has kept in all of his work has been, uh, you know, the consistency of his characters in whatever story that they're in. So we're not really dragging Kevin Smith as, you know, to shit on him, but we're dragging him really more out of disappointment of what could be or could have been. Yeah, that's my attitude. That was like, because there was a time I would, I really cared about what this guy was doing because I thought it was vital and interesting and provocative. Like, I remember, like, Chasing Amy was a movie that made me think. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Clerks was a movie that that spoke to me in the same way that Pulp Fiction did, and yeah. now I couldn't care less. I mean, I'll still see a skew of his films because that's where his strengths lie. But and honestly, I mean, I just I'm not really too interested in seeing any of his other stuff because, like, Yoga Hoser sounded like some utter nonsense to me. It's that like, is the okay. worst title of a film that has ever been made. <laughs> 
It has Nazi bratwurst in it. And I'll, yeah, dude, don't even ask me. Yeah, dude. <laughs> what does that and even mean? Bratsies. He's not in the film, oh, I don't think. Oh, God. But his, but his wife, his daughter, and Johnny Depp's daughter are all in that film. And I'm like, Kevin, I think you need to not make films that you yourself will not put yourself in as a character. Oh. Because... Though Zach and Miri make a porno is not terrible. You know, we didn't mention Zach and Miri make a porno. You're right. That one is not terrible. And it does have heart. It does. It does. It it's does a movie that I, I started watching it not realizing it was a Kevin Smith movie. Is that him or is that Seth Rogen? It's Seth, Seth Rogen, Rogen is in, in it. Seth Rogen is and, and um, what's her name is the, the actress. Mira Sorino? No, 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 no. Um... Not with the Bashu. Uh, I really should not have to look up who's in Zack and Mary. Look, we Porno. have look. We are all men of Mary, experience, Mary, education, and knowledge, which means we forget Mary, more than we've ever remembered. Uh, this, this Jason is, Mewes was in it, though. Elizabeth Banks. Elizabeth. There we go. Elizabeth Banks, and yes, uh, yeah, uh, Jason Mewes showed up in it at some point, and while I was watching, I was like. That's Jason. Is this a Kevin Smith movie? Because I just I was just watching it with my wife. It was like, I heard this was funny. We should check it out. So we're watching it, and we're enjoying it. It's like, this is pretty clever. Yeah, this isn't bad. It's good stuff. Like, is that Jason Mewes? Like, is this a Kevin a good... Smith movie? It is. And I I'd <laughs> forgotten about it too. And then I thought something like, wait, no, that was a pretty good Kevin Smith movie that wasn't view as Cubers. He wasn't in. Um maybe the secret sauce is that if he doesn't have Jason Mewes in his movie. Muse is his move. Muse. Did, did, Holy did, shit. Doesn't Muse. Wait, wait. What? I just, I just remembered. The whole, one of the whole reasons that Phil, outside of a love of films with his father that Smith got into filmmaking is that he really thought other people should see the utter manic insanity of Jason Muse. He's like, someone has to put this guy in a film or write a character like this guy and put him in a film. <laughs> And that's one of the big motivators that got Kevin Smith to do Clerks was people have to see this dude. Like, this dude is just fucking funny. He's a one-man show. Um, um, I think one... you nailed it, Kieran. Yeah, that's his muse. If he doesn't have muse in it... And funny enough, Jason, Jay Muse is himself going on to direct, and he actually directed the very last film that Stan Lee showed up in as a cameo. Oh. He did the very last film that Stan Lee showed up in. Yeah, because he uh, he had worked with Stan Lee on Mallrats, you know, mm -hmm. and so and Kevin was involved in Stan Lee's life, you know, and interviewing him for quite a bit after that. And so I think we just came out. He said, "Hey, man, I, I want to do a film. I'd really love if you were in it." And Stan's like, "Oh yeah, sure, I'll do it." Um, yeah, there you go. There, that is the secret sauce of Kevin Smith. If his heterosexual life mate is not in the film, not going to be as good. Yeah, there it is. Muse is literally his muse. Mm. Seems like it. Yeah. Right? I think the only, um... Jesus Christ, why is reality so badly written? <laughs> That's a whole different cat. That's going to be a different podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would actually be a fun episode. That <laughs> Are we in be. a podcast? We can... <laughs> Are we a air simulation go or a podcast? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, Why is our simulation badly written? God damn it! <laughs> this shit doesn't happen in real life. Or to, to quote Boondock Saints, this, this is, this is bad movies. Yeah. Yeah. This doesn't happen in real life. Yeah. <laughs> a little assault guy crawling around in the beginning. <laughs> oh, what are we gonna do with the rope? Uh, what are you yeah. Need the rope for? Yeah, no. no. <laughs> I haven't rewatched that in a while. I need to. Yeah, I got both of them on Blu-ray. I because... started watching the second movie, and I, I, I think I got bored. Yeah, you can't now. I got not bored. as good. Not as good. Just saying, cavalry tread. Okay, so we've established that Kevin Smith is definitely not Quentin Tarantino. Um, he's not Charles. Definitely not Charles Bukowski. No. Um, he might be Henry Rollins. Um. <laughs> And that's just funny right there. <laughs> that is. I don't care who you are. That's just funny that right there. That is funny right there. Um, and Jason Mewes is his muse. Yes. Um, yes. What's... 
We've said that his his he's you know Mike, you kept saying that he's he's still a good writer mm-hmm. and his yeah. he still has a sense for character and his character still ring true, mm-hmm. which I would have to agree on. Uh, I would like it if he stopped like eating on the seed corn of stuff he's already written. Yeah, it, some more like Zach and Mary make a porno. I think would be would be better for him. Um, yeah, but what's his like? <sighs> Is he just not that good at com- creating compelling visual storytelling? Is that is that his limitation? It might be. Um, I mean, it's real. It's real easy to be hailed as Art Nouveau or an Artia if you do a film in black and white and it does well. And you know, and you know, I mean, well, it's, it's also it's it's smaller scale. I think he has a good sense of visual storytelling. I think he doesn't know how to express it as a director. Like, I think he could go to someone, like, because he has worked, he's done some really decent work in comic books, which means he's had to go to someone and explain to them his visual direction. Okay. And they've gone and drawn it. And it's worked out pretty good with his storytelling, visual storytelling that well, that way. And he works good, like I said, on comic book stuff. I think it's just that's where his passion is now. Like he's not some retail dude in Jersey anymore and has not been for t- over 20 years. And you can't write something you're that far from. It'd be like me trying to write like about what I was like when I was 20, which was largely boneheaded and a fucking wild man. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's going back to that. It's like 20 years away from the character or person that you were makes it very hard to relate to and write from that perspective sure. or even understanding what the fuck was I thinking? That's valid. That's valid. You know, you gotta, I, from what I understand and I've, I've tried my hand at, at the writing gig myself. I mean, um, hell I freaking was a lit major. My whole idea was that I was going to be a writer. Um, that is not how things turned out. Cause it turned out I was a really good artist and never knew, but you got to be able to write from experience. And one of the things that always helped me back from doing much writing is at the time I was trying to be a writer, I was 20, 22, 23. What had I experienced? Or at least I couldn't write outside of my experiences because I had a hard time empathizing with the plights of other people. Mm-hmm. Now I might do a better job, but, um, you know, there are weaknesses in here. I can do, I can do a real quick short story. I could never do a novel. I could never do a novel. Not like I don't. I, I can't. I could not do a sustained. Like, I have a pretty clear idea where I want a story to end. I got a pretty clear idea where it's beginning. That middle part, mm, it's kind of like underpants gnomes territory. <laughs> First rule, underpants. Second rule, question mark. Third pant rule, profit. That's the yeah. steps. Well, I'm. I'm. It's usually that question mark. You know, George R. R. Um, Martin is stuck in those question marks right now. <laughs> look. Look, that motherfucker oh, oh need to go on a diet. No, no. <laughs> he need to he need to go on a diet, get that pre diabetes treated, fucking, and you know, you know, maybe do some Pilates or some shit. I don't know, and get his ass back on that grindstone. That was a visual. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> Well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> By the same token, um, if you find out that there's a Kevin Smith short film um, called The Flying Car, uh, there isn't. It's a six-minute outtake from Clerks 2. Uh, it's quite clearly a six-minute outtake from Clerks 2 because you've got Dante and Randall, and they're just in a car talking. They're stuck in traffic, and they're talking about a flying car, and it's the thing where Randall gets Dante to say something stupid and then makes fun of him for saying it. Yeah. <laughs> like like that scene in the car when he admits to trying to suck his own dick. <laughs> it's, it's that scene except way more. It's like, that scene except way, 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 way more. Dante's character is way too trusting, especially having a friend, best friend like Randall, because I have friends I know will trip your ass up, and I am cautious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am also that friend that will trip your ass up, so you kind of got to be cautious. Yes, yes. Speaking, like, of, 
Speaking of which, um, did any of you ever see the Clerks animated series? Yes. 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 <laughs> I like the first half of it. It was it was hilarious. I like the last episode. It was it was fucking bonkers. <laughs> Bear drive like, car. How that happened? <laughs> Yeah, it's like that. It's like that Bugs Bunny cartoon, the or the Daffy Duck cartoon, where like uh, the the Duckamuck. It's basically Duckamuck, yeah. where where the the animator keeps screwing with Daffy Duck, and it's it's. And in that, fact, that's how that's how it ends. That's how it ends with is, with Jay and Silent Bob drawing a like, drawing. and I a stinker nugget nugget ooch, and that's that's <laughs> yeah. how this Clerks animated series ends, and it's it's great. Yeah, no, I had a VHS tape series. of it. <laughs> Shit, I think I had a I had a roommate that had it on a DVD, um, and we watched that shit. I'm like, all right, cool. I mean, that that's some entertaining <laughs> shit. But an intro with uh, with him and um, uh, Smith getting massages, and then like, and then it's like it's Muse and Smith getting massages, and then like Jason Muse looks up and he's like, ah, see that you've bought the DVD. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say all of the words that we couldn't say in the end, and he's just like. <laughs> <laughs> and just like yeah, like every dirty this, word, like, yeah, 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 litany yeah. of like swear words. Yeah. It's hilarious. It, it was just yeah. I was talking to a mutual friend of uh, me and Mike's that I have not seen forever, and has had children since I last saw them about four years ago. Woo! And I, I was telling them, I was telling them, Lenny, I was telling, her, yeah, we got a podcast. Like, can I listen to it around my children? I'm like, can you have me talk to me around your children? She's like. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Listen to I'm it. In like, your, listen to it in your car. Like, like no. no. I was like, no, hun. Um, because I am unable to not say the word fuck for any extended conversation. Yeah. You know this about me. I will say the word fuck. I can't. It, it's almost. I fucking can't help myself. Yeah. We know. Yeah. We know. It's okay. It's, it's, You're not my problem. I'm my problem. Yeah. I'm my problem. Like you, you should probably listen to it when the kids are in bed, unless you want them to pick up good old Uncle Kieran's language. And yeah. um, like, well, this is good because uh, I can. I still find myself saying "well played, clerks" to people, and no one gets it. <laughs> so I'm glad you get it. I'm glad somebody gets it. I just do it randomly. Well played, clerks, and I get looks. Like, is, is that from something? Yeah. Nobody, nobody remembers. Well, Somebody would have been weird. on twenty years ago, and you wouldn't know. And you didn't even get when I do Doctor Evil anymore, kids. So it doesn't they, matter. Uh, yeah, that is true. They, People don't uh, get Doctor Evil. I anymore. think like the Clerks animated show was only on for like two episodes before they took it off the air, right? Yeah, they didn't I even. They right. only had like six episodes, and then they like they made uh, six and may have aired two. Yeah. Good God, you know, but yeah, you're right. I forgot about the Clerks cartoon, but I don't know how much Kevin Smith was actually involved with that. I mean, certainly to an extent, but that's a good point. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I haven't seen if he's got any screenwriting credits on. He probably does, but I don't know. Yeah, you know, Doesn't it's matter. like there's like like I saw a Flash animation way way back that was called Troops, which was like a Star Wars riff on Clerks, and in the credits of Troops, which is because it has Darth, Darth J and Silent Sidious, right? It's hilarious, and it has Dante, Dante and Randall as troop uh, stormtroopers uh, on the quickie stop on the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's it's a flash animation. It is hilarious, and in the credits, the guy says, "And a special thanks to Kevin Smith, Kevin Smith, for writing characters that write that are so easy to that, that, that write themselves." That I can literally just have them write themselves. That it still a, sounds like something. That is a strength. That is a and real that's strength. like. And if you ever see, it's called Troops. Um, it is. I don't know if you can find it on the YouTube or not, but it is beautiful how Kevin Smith it is, and how dialogue wise, it's right in. Like Dantooine, you went all the way to Dantooine. You know, it's just like <laughs> I can hear it. <laughs> it's it's. And it also has a clever little aside of how the rebels got the plans um, in it, which is you'll probably enjoy it more than, you does know, it, Rogue One. It, it probably makes more sense than Rogue One. 
But that's not really Kevin Smith's problem. Kevin Smith's that is problem not Kevin is Smith's something problem. else altogether. And Kevin, it might not even be a problem. Let's stipulate this guy's way more successful than than, than we are or have been oh, yeah, in, absolutely. in creative arts. So Kevin Smith is winning and we're just tiny little dogs yapping at his heels saying, do it better, do it better, do it better. Like, dude, I started Ben Affleck's career. What have you done? But here's why we do it. We do it because we believe he's capable of better. Yeah. That's yeah. true. It's, it's not that we think you're shit and you're always going to be shit and you should just lick your own asshole and not have any money. No, we're like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> dude, you can do better. We know you can do better. Again, that's an image. <laughs> <laughs> no, <Nope>, locked up. Uh, <laughs> you've got practice at it, Mike. Yep. You've, known me, you've known me for over 20 years. You have practice. Oh, shit. Like 21. Dude, our friendship is old enough to drink. It is. Has been that, really our that, friendship is old that's enough. That's fitting. That's fitting. Um, it probably needs to at this point. Wow, we definitely veered like some sons of bitches, didn't we? We we, we <laughs> killed the topic like twenty minutes ago, but we we'll just, just keep talking. We'll just drop this <laughs> well, all right, all right. So let's uh, let's sti- let's stick a pin in this. Um, okay. We have we have Kevin Smith our way to to reboot, and uh, we have we have, and uh, we never even talked about Clerks too, which. Mm. Ah, uh, I mean, it is the second verse. It's not bad. It's, not it's, bad. it's definitely got it's got Rosario Dawson in it, uh, who does beautiful in it, and it's got Kevin Smith's wife, who dyes her hair blonde for it, and plays Dante's fiance. Yes, that's right. Uh, I remember thinking it, it was it wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be. It's one of those things where I hated that it existed, and then I saw, I was like, okay, that's fine. I like the way it ended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a wonderful finality to it and an appropriateness. And that's the only time that they repeated uh, You're Not Supposed to Be Here Today that I actually enjoyed it. Because Randall did is like, hey, you know what? You're not supposed to be here today. And I was like, oh, we're doing a thing. And they acknowledged that we're doing a thing. So that like took the sting of it away. Also, can you really hate a movie with a donkey show? <laughs> I mean, can you really hate a movie with a donkey show? I've forgotten about that. That should be our title for the podcast. Can you really hate a movie with a donkey show? I'm not making that the title, Karen. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. That's not happening. I've forgotten the donkey show. Uh, uh, I've changed my mind about Clerks too now. <laughs> hey, you're going to get old one day, and you're going to be like, man, now I'm an old man, and it's so PC, and I can't, there's nowhere a donkey show to be found. My <laughs> life has been wasted. I could have seen them in my youth, but no, no. I had to be judgy about the donkey show, and now I'm curious and have questions but cannot research it adequately. I'm going to take that chance, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Smart choice. So this has been shallow and pedantic. (laughs) 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 Uh, I am your singing telegram. All right. Thank you all for stopping by. We'll. (laughs) I'm probably even going to get credit for that. (laughs) (laughs) We're never going to end this episode. It's never going to (sighs) end. I'm Kieran. I'm not liking Clerks 2 anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, aren't we art house? Uh, we are. We are. I want it all black and white with, with the, the device from Frasier telling me exactly what scene is supposed to be happening right now. And it should end with Finn. 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 <laughs> no more buttered scones for me, Mater. I'm off to play the grand piano. Yeah, no. <laughs> Uh, oh no <laughs> alright no oh, seriously I'm Andrew and I'm Kieran I'm Mike got to say that twice and this has been Shallow and Pendantic that's what it's been be well